Jiang He. He's a co-founder of the senior uh, and senior director of the uh, scientific affairs of Weijing. Um, Jiang completed his PhD in Dr. Xiao Weichuang's lab at Harvard University and postdoc uh, at uh, Sanjita Bhatia's lab in, at MIT. And his research has been focusing on single molecule imaging techniques and applying them in different, different biological areas. And now when he's leading with Jing, Jiang oversees the research, assay development, and application of image-based single cell spatial genomic platform. And um, Jiang has received numerous awards and has been recognized in Forbes magazine 30 and 30 in healthcare. And when Kirk and I reached out to Jiang earlier this year, um, when we were approaching the multiplex imaging area of RNA detection, we were really deeply impressed by his enthusiasm and openness. And uh, with that, um, Jiang, please take it away and um, looking forward to your talk. Thank you very much, Quinn, for the very kind of introduction. And thank you, Kirk and Quinn, for uh, inviting me to uh, this as well. I'm really excited to actually uh, share um, what we're doing here at Wisdom with the uh, plant community. and. Uh, actually, based on the conversations with uh, Quinn and Kirk before, I um, realized that actually uh, in the plant community, there is a lot of uh, biological samples prepared in paraffin embedded, um, the, uh, formerly in fixed and paraffin embedded format. So uh, for today's uh, presentation, I actually sort of took a little bit and, uh, and sharing some uh, newest updates on this front. Um, so hopefully that will be very relevant for the uh, plant research community. <coughs> So um, I will give a very first um, few slides of brief introduction of <laughs> what we're doing here at Wisdom, uh, the technology, and then um, in the second part, um, then I will focus on the um, sort of technology development in imaging and cell atlas in uh, FFP samples. Um, and as you can see from this slide, um, so biological systems are very uh, complex and specially organized in 3D and over the past, uh, two or three decades, there has been a lot of progress <coughs> from the sequencing or, or <coughs> you know, field to sort of interrogate the gene expression profile. Uh, but as you can imagine, bulk or single cell sequencing um, actually uh, still a bit limited because it can only show us parts. Uh, it is very difficult to use sequencing to infer, uh, for example, where cells are coming from, how, how individual cells are interacting with each other. So uh, our understanding of different biological systems, if, purely using sequencing sometimes can uh, still far from complete. Um, and in recent years, a new field called spatial genomics uh, emerged and <laughs> they started to add the critical spatial component back to the biological systems and also offers truly highly multiplexed uh, direct in situ detection of different biomolecules. So, um, and as of now, I think the term spatial genomics is really getting recognized and we're seeing the exponential growth of publications in this field, really uh, uh, highlighting the excitement about this field uh, for, <coughs> for different research um, community. So just to put everything into context, so for biologic system without any special context, you are basically uh, seeing many things scrambled, but um, if you have everything in context, um, then you kind of see where different cells are and how they interact uh, with each other. And that's why it is so important to have a, a tool that will not only uh, enable sort of multiplexed imaging at single cell level, but at the same time, uh, add the critical spatial component back. So uh, in general, the field of spatial genomics, uh, there are uh, two major camps of technologies. Um, first is imaging-based, uh, second is sequencing-based. Uh, uh, to <coughs> accomplish this goal. So, um, for example, sequencing based technologies are often sort of barcoding the um, nuclear acid RNAs, for example, uh, in situ first, and then the RNAs will be released uh, for extra situ RNA seq. So, the sequencing based technologies can achieve whole transcriptome imaging, but often suffers from lower spatial resolution and lower sensitivity. Uh, while the other camp, which is um, one of the technologies that I'm going to describe today, um, this is <coughs> often known with much higher resolution and high sensitivity, but um, it is 
uh, a more targeted approach to image different by molecules of interest. And there are two major categories. One is in situ sequencing. The second uh, is uh, fluorescence in situ hybridization uh, based technology. And for me, I'm going to focus on multiplexed fish technology uh, here for the presentation. So this company, uh, actually, Wisdom uh, is working on uh, uh, actually the first one to truly launch a spatially resolved single cell uh, transcriptomic profiling platform to the market called uh, Merscope. So this is a, a RNA imaging based platform where hundreds to thousands of genes can be imaged in a single run with very high sensitivity and accuracy. And the platform can image very large uh, image of error up to one square centimeter with down to 100 nanometer resolution. Uh, there's no need for sequencing. And this is an a end-to-end solution where um, chemistry, the data acquisition instrument, and visualization, visualization software will all come together. <coughs> and <coughs> pictured here is the uh, MERSCO platform. And this is based on a foundation technology called MERFISH. And in the next few slides, uh, I'm going to uh, explain the principle of MERFISH technology. <coughs> So MERFISH stands for Multiplexed Error Robust Fluorescence in Situ Hybridization. Um, so this is based on uh, traditional fish technology uh, called single molecule fish. So on the slide here, uh, this is showing the principle of SM fish, uh, where fluorescently tagged oligoprops are used to label different RNA species. And in this uh, schematic here, you are seeing, uh, for example, different RNA species in this color lines. And by counting the dots that are fluorescent as shown on the right, then you get a sense of how uh, different genes are expressed inside a cell at subcellular resolution. So SM fish is very well known for its sensitivity. Um, and um, there is a limitation of, about SM fish though. Uh, so basically the multiplexing level of SM fish um, usually is limited, often less than uh, four different markers or RNA species can be imaged simultaneously. And as the technology, MERFISH uh, actually breaks that limitation and enables highly massively multiplexed RNA fish imaging at the same time. And uh, this is a, a technology come from uh, Dr. Xiaowei Zhuang's lab at Harvard University, first described in science back in uh, 2015. Um, so on this slide, I'm going to uh, sort of walk through the schematics of how MERFISH works. So since it's an imaging-based technology, the first thing that we do is to uh, actually assign the error robust binary buckle <coughs> to different genes of interest. Uh, you can see here how uh, there's three genes and using gene one here as highlighted here, we will first assign the barcode and then <coughs> then uh, we will hybridize the uh, different RNA species uh, with, a, with a set of oligoprops. This set of oligoprops has a binding region, a target region that will be able to bind to the RNA species, uh, but it also has uh, these readout sequences hang, hanging out that can allow readout probes to bind. So once completing this first step binding events, then uh, we flow in uh, the readout probes in uh, different rounds of imaging. And uh, in the first round, for example, if there's a binding event, it will show up as a fluorescence signal. And then uh, this would decode as one, and then the signal will be extinguished. And then uh, another subset of readout probes will be flowing in again. <coughs> and then if there is signal, then it would decode as one. If there is no signal, it would decode as zero. And by repeating this cycle, essentially it started to build up a, a barcode, an optic barcode. And using this optical signal, then uh, we basically use this to match with the pre-assigned um, error robust binary barcode. And this helps uh, eventually to resolve and um, identify different RNA species in situ. And what's very really nice about this barcoding scheme is that it has a inherent built-in uh, error checking and error correction uh, capability. So we only use a small subset of barcode uh, barcodes in the available barcode space. So uh, due to some misbinding events, sometimes there could be some false positive binding events, um, and such <coughs> events can be detected and even corrected. Uh, and uh, actually, this is quite critical for highly multiplexed imaging because any error could lead to false positives. So with this ability to now label and resolve many different RNA species or biomolecules at the same time, this essentially uh, allows researchers to zoom in into different tissue and visualize the gene expression in situ from across the whole tissue 
to single cell level to down to subcellular resolution. So you can see different colored dots are actually indicating different RNA species imaged in the mouse brain sample. <laughs> so I wanted to highlight a couple of key advantages of um, this plat platform and then uh, later walk through sort of the demonstration uh, in the uh, FFP sample. Um, so <coughs> the first two key feature about Murphy's technology is that this is a highly quantitative measurement across a very dynamic range of uh, gene expression profile. So uh, showing here, this is a, a tissue measurement for about 500 genes in the uh, mouse brain tissue. Um, and each dot represents a gene. Um, and you can see the y-axis is the copy number per cell measured by Murphish. And the x-axis is the FPK value from bulk RNA sequencing. So basically benchmarking against traditional technologies such as bulk sequencing, uh, it maintains this linear range of correlation very nicely with correlation coefficient at 0.88. And this dynamic range uh, spans more than four orders of magnitude. Um, so this is very important for many researchers who uh, are working with um, genes that may be lowly expressed because um, not only this technology can pick up genes at high expression level accuracy, but also lowly expressed genes for genes that expressed less than one copy per cell. <coughs> so the second key feature of this technology is it is exceptional detection efficiency. And um, again, as at the introduction, I was mainly mentioning two categories of spatial genomics approaches. Um, there's a, a sequencing uh, as a situ uh, sequencing RNA seq based technology and then the imaging based. And on this slide, I'm comparing the Murphy versus uh, one of those technologies, the array based platform here um, in the matched brain slice. Uh, you can see with one of the genes, OPRD1, um, uh, you can clearly see where these genes distributed across the mouse brain uh, while with array based platform. Uh, there are only a couple of grid spots uh, highlighted there. Uh, and if you zoom in, Murphish can give uh, truly single cell resolution and um, the distribution of this particular gene, you can see that they're expressed in a couple of cells in this particular hippocampal region. Uh, while if we zoom in at array-based platforms, uh, since the grid spot size is quite big, it doesn't provide true single cell resolution. And in between, there's a lot of dead space. And when comparing the uh, uh, Murphish versus the array-based platform, we found that uh, Murphish was able to detect 70 times more transcripts per gene um, versus the array-based platform. So truly highlighting the sensitivity of um, imaging-based technologies. <coughs> so the third feature I uh, wanted to highlight for Murphish here is uh, actually um, the ability to do true single cell uh, atlas in, in situ. Um, uh, and um, this is a paper shown on this slide is a paper published in Cancer Cell uh, last year. Um, the uh, researchers were interested in using Murphy's technology to um, analyze and profile different cell types uh, in glioblastoma. And uh, they designed a few hundred uh, gene panel com uh, uh, compiling a, a list of hundreds of genes. And then um, they were able to identify different cell types in the glio glioblastoma. And I wanted to first draw your attention to the middle heat map here. Um, so they did single cell RNA-seq as well as Murphish. And um, uh, hopefully you can appreciate how similar the heat map looks like, um, really highlighting that Murphish was able to recapitulate the gene expression features uh, uh, captured by single cell RNA-seq. But since Murphish is an imaging-based technology uh, and it's a true in situ measurement, it provides the information that single cell RNA-seq cannot provide. And that's highlighted on the right. Um, so in this particular study, uh, they measured the mean number of macrophages in 30 nearest cells to a subtype of glioblastoma cells. And very interestingly, they found enrichment of macrophages adjacent to uh, a subtype of glioblastoma cells in situ. So uh, you can imagine that this sort of true cell atlas and capability uh, now started to make this type of cell-cell uh, interaction studies uh, possible in situ. <laughs> and lastly, uh, the feature I wanted to mention is the uh, very high cell throughput of uh, this platform. So um, for people who ha may have been doing single cell sequencing, um, if you wanted to do say, one million cell single cell sequencing. The sheer cost of sequencing will sometimes be so high that almost uh, affordable for 
<coughs> so cases, but for imaging based technology to scale up cell throughput, uh, it's actually relatively straightforward. Um, we just need to tie more field of views for imaging and our microscope, it's a single field of view is 200 by 200 microns and by tiling hundreds sometimes to thousands of field of views, uh, that's how we capture a large uh, tissue area like this in a mouse brain. Uh, like this, and you can zoom in across any region of the brain and get a sense of how different genes are expressed in individual cells uh, here. So each color of dots here are showing, uh, 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 this is a RNA subset out of a 500 gene measurement. You can see um, the distribution of different genes uh, in, in, individual, in individual cells. And for this platform, it profiles up to one square centimeter sized tissue, and sometimes you can uh, capture hundreds of thousands and even up to a million cells uh, in a single experiment. And what's nice about it is that you get everything from a MRFish uh, or MERSCOPE run, there's no follow-up sequencing needed. Uh, so save a lot of sequencing cost. <coughs> and as mentioned, this um, behind the platform MRFish um, is the backbone technology has been uh, uh, really very well validated in the field. It has been many publications in the field now and many more in preprint and across the globe, many institutions are already using Murfish or Merscope um, through Wisdom's commercial efforts. <coughs> so I wanted to sort of give a couple of examples of how different researchers are using uh, this platform before diving into sort of a, 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 a demonstration here, um, just to highlight um, sort of how even without FFP sample, how different researchers are using uh, this technology at the moment to gather different in, uh, biological insights. So the first uh, study came from Wash U at St. Louis from Dr. Ben Hamfer's lab. Um, so they um, profiled a panel of 243 genes in the mouse kidney, and they were interested in studying kidney injury. Uh, and uh, adjacent kidney size uh, was sent to be profiled by a ray-based <coughs> platform. So showing on the slide here, um, there is one gene called SLC12A1, which is a kidney-specific sodium potassium chloride co-transporter uh, provided by um, the array-based platform and MERSCOPE. Uh, and hopefully just glancing at the pictures, I hope you can see the striking difference uh, in terms of the sensitivity and the resolution. Um, for example, you can see way more elaborate structures labeled by SLC12A1 by uh, MERSCOPE measurement. So the second example, um, I want to highlight, I think um, is quite relevant for the uh, researchers who are in the cell atlasing community. Um, so this is a paper published in Science back in 2018. Um, so the authors used Murphy's to profile a panel of 155 genes in a, a region called mouse hypothalamus. Um, and uh, they ended up finding around 75 different cell types in this particular brain region. Um, so in this study, um, the authors profiled almost half a million cells. So uh, showing at the top left, what you are seeing is a T-SNE plot projecting all the different cell clusters in um, the T-SNE plot, plot here with a major cell classes colored uh, here. And uh, at the same time, uh, they were also able to um, perform a single cell RNA-seq and um, they, the authors very carefully evaluated the benchmark Murphy's uh, results versus single cell RNA-seq. And as shown by the correlation plot here, Murphy's was able to recapitulate all the cell types formed by single cell RNA seq. Uh, and what's really uh, not shown here, but I think very interesting, is that Murphy's was even able to identify newer cell types not formed by single cell RNA seq. So this was actually made possible by two features of uh, Murphy's technology. The first um, was the uh, high cell throughput. By sampling more cells, rare cell types will be uh, more easily captured, thereby uh, <coughs> they can identify rare cell types more readily. The second feature is the high sensitivity of Murphy's technology, which uh, enables the researchers to use lowly expressed but functionally very important genes, uh, and in this particular case, neuropeptides, uh, to specify different cell types. But beyond just providing a catalog of cells, um, no, like, like shown in the t plot here, um, the, since this is a spatial technology, um, now 
um, we were able to actually project the cells in space now. Um, so what you're seeing here in the middle panel here is the uh, <coughs> distribution of all the major cell classes uh, in space from anterior to posterior. So hopefully you can um, appreciate the heterogeneity of different cell types uh, in this complex tissue. And finally, by including marker genes that can report um, cellular activity, and particularly in this case, a gene called c -force. Um, So the, the researchers here were able to uh, <coughs> identify individual neuronal types that are uh, uh, selectively activated during social behaviors such as parenting or mating behaviors. For example, you can see uh, this particular cluster, uh, I-15 here, is um, responding to parenting behavior. And now, uh, not only they can identify those cell types, but then map those cells in space uh, in the hypothalamus. So hopefully this study um, sort of gives you a sense of how we can use MERFISH to map cell types, characterize cell function and state, and perform true cell atlas in, you know, in complex tissue. <clears throat> and with Invision, uh, we keep pushing the limit of the technology and proven uh, MERFISH in more than 30 different tissue types, many in mouse and human, but uh, we're now also going beyond mouse and human now. Uh, this is going to uh, rat. Uh, we have demonstrated in rat, in uh, monkey. <coughs> <coughs> and also there's already some researchers uh, very interested in adopting this to uh, the, the, the plant research, for example, Raptopsis uh, to meadow roots and such um, nowadays. Uh, but as we started to move into um, sort of um, now, mouse and non-human samples, uh, oftentimes we hear that the sample types that they prepare uh, are FFP samples. And actually this is also the case for human samples because FFP is very widely used uh, in the uh, clinical space. So one of the questions that uh, pe uh, people often ask is that can uh, MERSCO be used in FFP samples? So uh, in the next <coughs> set of slides, I'm going to sort of really highlight <coughs> some of the progress in um, Mariscope imaging in FFP samples and share um, some of the newest results we have. Um, let me just check the time to make sure I'm on track. Um, so to give some context here, why uh, FFP samples and um, sort of in situ uh, single cell transcriptom transcriptomic imaging in FFP samples is relevant and important. So there are two major categories of uh, tissue preservation method uh, mentioned on this slide here, uh, fresh or fixed frozen or formerly fixed paraffin embedded samples. Um, so uh, for fresh frozen or fixed frozen samples, uh, oftentimes the sample may better preserve the DNA or RNA and it is compatible for single cell analysis. Uh, however, <coughs> this is a very costly solution for long-term storage and often not available for clinical practices. <coughs> and on the other hand, FFP samples can be stored at room temperature and very cost effective. Uh, it can even better preserve tissue morphology uh, and one of the most widely used clinical samples. But there are a lot of challenges working with this uh, sample type. For example, heavy cross-linking uh, makes it difficult for probes to get into FFP samples. Uh, degradation and fragmentation of RNAs made it difficult to uh, detect the RNA species. And since it's almost impossible to dissociate an FFP sample, thereby for single cell sequencing analysis, uh, working with FFP samples uh, is just a major uh, challenge here. <coughs> so with Invision, we have actually developed a new chemistry to enable uh, single cell uh, in situ transcriptomic imaging in FFP samples. And uh, in order to demonstrate how this works, we ended up first choosing mouse brain to benchmark and evaluate the performance of our chemistry. Um, so the reason behind this is that uh, we wanted to choose a tissue type or a sample type that has very well annotated gene expression profile or for different biomarkers, thereby we can compare with publicly available data sets. And secondly, um, there has been a lot of uh, data sets, even for special genomics measurement on the brain samples already, thereby, again, <coughs> we can compare our results with other technologies and uh, sort of benchmark the performance against um, each other so that we, we can really see how this new chemistry works. So 
show you on this slide, what you are seeing is the panel of 483 genes measured in FFP mouse frame. And on the left, you are seeing a distribution of all transcripts uh, in a chronal section of the brain. And there is a zoomed in region of the cortical region. So overall in this small piece, we detected 45 million transcripts in around 55,000 cells uh, with the mean transcripts per cell around 816. Uh, so this is very similar to a publicly available data set that uh, Winston has released about a year ago when we did the fresh frozen samples. Um, so from the numbers, it looks all right. Um, so next we wanted to sort of evaluate against some publicly available data sets. And Adler Institute has uh, <coughs> very nicely put together many um, uh, in situ hybridization data for the mouse. So um, at the bottom, what I'm showing here is a select of four genes out of this measurement, uh, GFAP, CNR1, DRD2, and ADGRA1. And at, uh, on the top, what you are seeing is the Merskov image and bottom is the MISH uh, image. And hopefully you can see that actually Merskov image in FFP samples very nicely uh, recaptures <coughs> the ISH uh, data and an institute um, uh, has, share, uh, ha has posted. So going beyond just showing uh, the distribution of uh, the counts and uh, the, the genes and the counts, uh, um, next we uh, went ahead to do some even more rigorous benchmarking uh, for these data sets. Um, we did two uh, major <coughs> comparisons. The first is to compare with the bulk RNA sequencing measurement and see how sensitive and how accurate uh, our chemistry is uh, in FFP samples. So, Next, then, uh, so, sorry, uh, showing here is the comparison with um, the bulk RNA sequencing data. So the plot is very similar to what I described before. Um, so each dot is a gene, uh, and y-axis is Murphy's counts, and x-axis x -axis is the FPK value from bulk RNA sequencing. And hopefully you can see that um, the FFP workflow mean is highly quantitative and accurate, and um, it also knows profiling of genes um, not only at highly expressed range, but also at low expressed range, even uh, FP can value less than 0.01 copy. And it maintains a linear range of more than four orders of magnitude, uh, which again is uh, very similar to what we see in fresh frozen uh, samples I showed uh, a few slides ago. And in between different biological replicates at uh, the matching brain size, we found this is extremely reproducible measurement. Um, so. Um, uh, actually, the R value is 0.999 something, so it rounded up to one. Uh, that's why you're seeing an odd number like one here. But you can see from the dots, it's actually not a perfect nine. Uh, but it really indicates that this is a highly reproducible measurement uh, for different biological um, uh, uh, for biological duplicates. <coughs> and then next, we compared the workflow uh, at the bulk level or as well as single cell level uh, versus the fresh frozen workflow. So showing here. Uh, in this correlation plot is um, y-axis is the FFP protocol in FFP samples, while x-axis is the fresh frozen protocol in fresh frozen samples. And hopefully you can see from this correlation plot with R value uh, around 0.95, we, we were able to get comparable sensitivity versus the fresh frozen workflow. And leveraging the ability to do two cell atlasing in complex tissue, um, we went ahead and actually identified individual cells uh, in FFP samples and compared with the cell types identified in fresh frozen brain as well. So I'm going to play a short animation here. Uh, on the left, you are seeing the U map first with different cell types identified in this tissue. And then uh, I'm going to click across different cell types uh, in FFP as well as fresh frozen. And hopefully you can uh, see that the FFP workflow very nicely recapitulates the cell types identified by the fresh frozen workflow. So uh, hopefully this slide um, kind of really gives you a sense that not only at the bulk level, but at a single cell level, our workflow was able to maintain exceptional performance uh, in uh, the complex tissue and for doing um, cell atlasing. So having established the performance in the benchmarking sample, then um, the next big question is can the uh, protocol work <coughs> in different sample types or not. <coughs> so the next slide <coughs> showing here, excuse me, is um, um, 
uh, nerve scope imaging with a panel of 244 genes across uh, different human and uh, human diseased as well as normal tissues, which uh, purposely chose some normal tissues, again, for the purpose of benchmarking, because certain genes should only show up at certain location, thereby using normal tissue as a benchmarking. We can really evaluate if the measurement is actually showing the genes or biomarkers at the uh, expected <coughs> loci or spatial uh, site <coughs> location or not. And hopefully, by just glancing at some of the uh, pictures and marker genes here, I only showed a couple out of the 244 because it's very difficult to show hundreds of color images all at once. <coughs> um, so uh, you, you can kind of see the very nice um, <coughs> pictures across the six samples. <coughs> and I wanted to highlight one specific example here, which is actually the human skin. Human skin is a sample that has a lot of collagen content and for single cell analysis, dissociating cells uh, and fibroblasts and other cells from a uh, collagen rich uh, tissue like skin is extremely challenging. Uh, however, since this is a in situ technology, there is actually no dissociation needed. You just need to hybridize the sample with the probes thereby really allowed us to now very easily actually image hundreds of genes in a tissue like this, in a very challenging tissue for single cell analysis like this, and then uh, see the distribution of genes and cells. <coughs> for example, just highlighting a couple of genes here, keratin, uh, which labels the uh, keratinocytes in the epidermis. You can see that it very nicely layers uh, the epidermis here, and then there also <coughs> ACTA2, which labels the smooth small muscle actin. Again, <coughs> you can see where the green highlights. And similarly for kidney, um, for this is uh, for renal, renal filtration, there is a marker gene called photo, uh, size marker PODX um, uh, L, um, which labels the glomerular structure here. Again, the red is highlighting the structure very nicely here. And for all measurements, we actually extracted the RNA and did bulk RNA sequencing on these sample types, and then. Uh, we compared the MERSCOPE results versus the bulk RNA sequencing. And then uh, we did uh, extract the correlation coefficient with bulk RNA sequencing and plot it out in a bar chart like this. And again, hopefully you can see that for all the samples measured here, uh, uh, the correlation coefficient is about 0.7, indicating that this is highly accurate across all the samples we have measured so far. This um, chemistry is compatible with protein co-staining. Um, so on this slide here, this is showing the FFP human colon cancer with 343 genes, six protein co-staining. Uh, and uh, among, uh, across the tissue, there are around 67 million transcripts detected. On the left, what you are seeing is the distribution of street selected proteins out of this six, uh, pen ck SMA, and e-coherent. And then on the right, this is the distribution of all transcripts overlaid on top of the protein image. And the bottom are the zoom in. Hopefully, you can really see the protein code standing very nicely uh, as well as the RNA imaging. <coughs> so with the protein uh, standing capability established, then uh, it enables us now to actually uh, sort of uh, do self segmentation because for complex tissue, in order to do self-atlas, one of the Big challenges is how do we identify and sort of um, segment the cell. So uh, we uh, at Wisdom we do uh, we developed a cell boundary staining kit, uh, which <coughs> made it possible to stain uh, the plasma membrane of cells and with the DAPI staining indicating the nucleus. And by using deep learning based cell segmentation algorithm, um, then we are able to sort of segment cells and uh, and generate the cell masks on top of each cell. So showing on the top left, you're seeing the immunofluorescence imaging of cell boundary. And then that um, by using the algorithm, then we are able to uh, identify the cells uh, in space. And then by assigning individual transcripts in each polygon shape now, then we started to have a true sort of count per cell uh, in space. So that uh, made it possible then to do downstream single cell analysis and generate EU map like this uh, shown out in uh, figure C here. But what's really nice about the spatial technology is that now we say you map plot uh, each dot representing a cell, you can now project the cells in space. Um, so this is what's showing in figure D now. 
where each polygon shape is an identified cell. And you can see the distribution of many different cell types in space in a complex tissue like FFP, liver cancer. And I'm highlighting in two major cell types here, fibroblast and endothelial cells with fibroblast expressing a marker gene called collagen one. Uh, and and the theta cells express in a marker gene called PKN1. Again, you, hopefully you can see uh, where the cells and the transcripts are. <laughs> so with all this uh, uh, sort of capability established, it put us at a stage where we can start to really do some very um, uh, large scale atlas in, uh, efforts. And this is something that uh, actually Wisdom uh, recently has sort of put some efforts to generate cancer cell atlas. So this is um, a data set that we're going to release uh, to the public, which uh, contains uh, eight sample type um, and 16 different data sets uh, with a panel of 500 genes. And you can see the different sample types here, the number of transcripts, the number of cells, and overall there are more than 4 billion transcripts uh, detected in over, uh, in around 9 million cells. Uh, and by, uh, to my knowledge, this is probably one of the biggest data sets publicly available uh, that has spatial contacts and that single cell resolution. <laughs> so on the right, these are a couple of plots characterizing the data sets. Uh, on the left, again, you are seeing how uh, reproducible our measurement is in uh, biological replicates. Um, so you can see some of the samples we did do replicates. And for one of the ovarian cancer sample, uh, you can see extremely high correlation uh, between biological uh, biological duplicates. And then for each data sets, we measured, uh, we extracted RNA, did bulk RNA-seq. And again, we were able to sort of do a correlation plot like this and then uh, take the correlation coefficient and then plot it in the bar chart. Again, all are showing with correlation coefficient above 0.7. <laughs> and finally, at the bottom right, since we are able to now segment individual cells and um, identify project them in space. So uh, what I'm showing at the bottom right, these beautiful images um, are showing the spatial distribution of identified cell types in tumor. So really started to <coughs> build a cancer cell atlas um, and, and, uh, and started to visualize and uh, sort of understand the heterogeneity of different cell types in complex tissue like in cancer. And just wanted to note that this is a uh, a data set that uh, Wisdom that will release to the public for free. So if you're interested, um, you can use the link here to click and download the data sets. Um, and hopefully um, this is something that will help researchers who are doing cell atlas um, uh, <coughs> to sort of understand sort of the data format as well as the performance. So in the next uh, last few minutes, I just wanted to uh, quickly highlight uh, what the data looks like. I, I know that I um, don't have too much time left here, um, but I just wanted to show a couple of images here in uh, one uh, specific example. So uh, uh, two specific examples. So here is uh, ovarian cancer uh, real action. This is a video showing the uh, um, real data with eight genes and then 500 genes at single cell. And then you can project the uh, transcripts in, <coughs> in space. And then on the right, this is you map special distribution of cells in space. Uh, so highlighting the power of cell atlas in ovarian cancer. And lastly, the last example I wanted to show <coughs> within the data sets is <coughs> how we characterize cell types uh, in breast cancer. So uh, showing here, this is a distribution of a few selected genes. You can keep zooming in our data sets and get a sense of how different cells are expressing different marker genes uh, at subcellular resolution. And with this ability, then it allowed us to characterize and identify all the major cell types. Um, so showing here is the UMAP plot of different cell types, and you can see the dot plot representing different marker genes. Uh, so with that and projecting the cells in space, then it, it allows us to actually identify different cells. <coughs> and I wanted to highlight one particular point here, because when we first did the characterization of a UMAP cluster, we found there are two populations of fibroblast. And then sometimes for single cell analysis, there is often an ambiguity for certain cell types. Is, is it a true cell type or not? But with imaging-based technologies, you can actually now zoom in in situ and characterize and actually investigate if this is making sense or not. For example, we zoomed into one region of this breast cancer sample, and we found that there are two populations of fibroblast. One population is expressing uh, 
collagen 1A, while the other population, which is marker gene for fibroblast, another one expressing a proliferation marker MKR67 in magenta here. <coughs> and again, if you look at the dot plot, marker gene here, um, fibroblast 2 uh, expressing this um, uh, <coughs> marker genes uh, mentioned uh, in, in D here. Again, this truly highlights the power of uh, imaging based technology to investigate uh, sort of cell types or character cell types uh, that could potentially be sort of in question if purely relying on sort of single cell analysis. Uh, and that highlights the power of in situ measurement. And, uh, uh, and even for doublets, um, sometimes single cell RNA seq analysis, there is some uncertainty in terms of whether cells uh, could be, uh, the identified cells could come from doublets or not. And now with the imaging based technology, you can just zoom in, see where cells are, and then you can see whether that's a one cell or two cells. And with that, the last uh, image here <coughs> is just we went ahead and actually sub clustered the TNK cells uh, in this breast cancer sample. And that further allowed us to subdivide the cells in seven different cell types. Um, <coughs> you can see the myelinate cells, CD4 cells, uh, CD8, T regulatory cells, NK cells. Uh, and uh, the marker genes, for example, uh, for T regulatory cells, Fox T3, um, this is the population of cells that shows exhaustion in tumor. Uh, and we do see exhaustion marker CTLA4 expressed together uh, within the T regulatory cells, uh, as shown in figure E here. And what's really nice is that you can now project everything in space. Because, uh, for example, T regulatory cells open times do tend to in infiltrate into the tumor and versus the regular CD4 T, <coughs> T cells, you can see that uh, this is a region where the blood vessels are infiltrated into the sample. Now, versus the uh, regular T CD4 T cells, T regs are indeed more infiltrating into the tumor in space. Um, so again, this kind of resolution, this kind of um, <coughs> sensitivity allowed us now to characterize the spatial distribution of different cell types and then the expression profile uh, in, in situ. <coughs> so just to um, summarize everything of what I mentioned today. So this is a highly multiplexed platform for two atlas in, uh, enabling hundreds to thousands of genes uh, imaging at the same time. And uh, it enables protein code detection. It has the highest resolution for, uh, it has very high resolution for across the tissue down to single cell to subcellular resolution imaging. Uh, and it has the highest detection efficiency for identifying RNAs and it features very high cell throughput up to sometimes a million cells uh, without any need for sequencing. And it's a very flexible platform on different samples and tissues. And uh, even though <coughs> I didn't share any plant results today, but uh, we do have uh, early adopters of our technology now exploring uh, the, the atlas in, in the plants now. <coughs> uh, with that, I wanted to say thank you um, for again for inviting me to this seminar. And um, if you have any questions, um, let me know. Thanks. So I'll ask one quick question um, from Luke, since it's really related to plants. Do you foresee any difficulties in applying this merfish to plant material? So based on our experience, if SM fish has been done, then merfish uh, can be relatively straightforward. And um, uh, so far, we have seen a lot of SM fish studies in FFP plants tissues. So uh, we believe it, sh it shouldn't be a problem for uh, plant tissue. Um, and I think uh, one thing that I wanted to mention a little bit is that plants do have a cell wall, which um, based on what we have seen has some autofluorescence. Uh, if the autofluorescence um, actually in this particular case uh, actually can be used to our uh, advantage because there is no need to do cell boundary staining because you can use cell wall to delineate the sort of the general cell shape uh, thereby helps with the downstream cell segmentation as well. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jiang, for the wonderful talk.